So let's begin today with uh, with lecture four. Uh, today we take a slightly different turn in, in the course. Uh, so far we have been looking at uh, galaxies, the structure of galaxies uh, as individual objects, and how we can measure the structure by looking at images of galaxies, looking at bulges, looking at disks, and trying to figure out whether an object is an elliptical, a lenticular, or something else. Uh, but today, we are going to take a slightly different turn and look at what is called quantitative morphology. So quantitative morphological classification has beca become very important in recent years because these modern large area digital imaging surveys carried out with CCD cameras, they generate vast numbers of galaxy images. Uh, these are clearly too many to classify. Even if you make a subsample, you will have thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of galaxies. So you're talking of a billion objects that have been observed uh, with the Sloan, with very large surveys uh, like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And uh, that will double, triple uh, in the coming years with the next generation uh, surveys. So some people have taken the approach that, okay, one person can't do galaxy classification, but perhaps many people uh, can do it. So there are a number of uh, citizen science projects that have been carried out mostly in the last decade or so. The leading one is something called Galaxy Zoo, uh, wherein uh, it's a citizen science project. People are shown images of galaxies one after the other, and they are uh, asked to classify them. Uh, this works to some extent. For example, if you pay, show people a spiral and you pay, show people an elliptical, uh, the citizens, ordinary people, are able to classify, to classify them. But if you show them a SC galaxy and a SD galaxy and tell them now you differentiate between these two, uh, that is something that the ordinary uh, people cannot do. Ordinary citizens cannot do. You need experts for that. So really, although citizen science is a partial solution, uh, it is not a complete solution. So some people have taken a different approach and said that, okay, we have lots of citizens, but we also have very fast computers now. So can we just do a, uh, a brute force uh, classification uh, using computers by, by just doing some kind of measurements, fitting and so on. And that is the broad field of uh, quantitative uh, morphology that I'm going to talk about today and in the next lecture. I should mention here something that I'm not going to cover, but is becoming increasingly important. So uh, as many of you uh, would have realized this, all this artificial intelligence, machine learning type technologies are becoming uh, more and more common in different domains. Uh, same holds true for astronomy. And there are a number of efforts worldwide to try to use uh, artificial intelligence based techniques for galaxy classification. So you you basically, instead of uh, getting citizens to classify galaxies, you teach a machine how to classify galaxies by looking at images directly and do it in essentially the same way that a human expert does by looking at images and uh, in various ways, in various filters and trying to figure out what the morphology is. So this is something that is a developing field. I will not cover that, but what I will uh, cover is quantitative morphology uh, not using AI, but using conventional techniques, uh, which have been used for the last two decades or so. So the idea behind quantitative morphology, the central idea is, the, is this one, is that you basically model uh, the light profiles of the different components of galaxies using different analytic functions, okay? And you basically carry out uh, best obtain a best fit uh, to your uh, to your galaxy light distribution uh, using uh, some best fit param uh, and obtain the best fit fit parameters corresponding to the free parameters in the analytic functions that you are using to model the light distribution. So this is the basic idea. In the literature, you will uh, find this uh, referred to frequently as bulge 
this decomposition. And that is because the most common uh, light uh, components uh, of galaxies are the bulge and the disk, as we have seen. So the idea is, uh, is then is to implement this into a code. And as we shall see, there are numerous codes available uh, publicly uh, to do this sort of thing. So what you essentially do is at the top left panel here, you have uh, your original image of a galaxy. And what you want to determine is uh, how much of the light is belongs to the bulge and how much of the light belongs to the disk at the simplest level, uh, because that will help you figure out. So for example, if 100% of the light belongs to the bulge, uh, you know it that it's all bulge galaxy, it's an elliptical galaxy. On the other hand, uh, uh, if the bulge uh, uh, contribution is very small, say 5% or 10%, then you know that this must be some kind of late type spiral uh, with a very low bulge. So, so we're trying to make quantitative measurements in order to figure out a qualitative thing like the uh, class to which a particular galaxy, morphological class to which a galaxy belongs. So then what you do is you iteratively build up a model uh, of the galaxy using your whatever functions. And we look at what functions are used for the bulge and the disk. And this uh, is usually an iterative process. You, you start with some trial values, you do a fit, uh, then you have some algorithm to improve the trial values. Then you do another fit and you keep on doing this till you get a good model like this. And how do you know that you have a good model? If you take the original galaxy and subtract the model galaxy, all you if you have a perfect model, all you should be left with is noise, right? Just noise. And how do you know that uh, you, you are left with just noise? Is if you plot a histogram of uh, the difference between the original galaxy and your best fit model, that should be Gaussian or near Gaussian. Right, uh, So that's what is shown here. Uh, sometimes uh, this mask thing is used. Sometimes if there is another galaxy or there is a star nearby in the image, et cetera, that you need to mask out, you need to ignore those pixels. Then uh, all of these codes have the provision of uh, masking out uh, certain pixels uh, so that they don't affect your fit. Uh, the x-axis of the histogram is a deviation in terms of the counts. So uh, suppose you have 100 counts in a particular pixel and 99 counts in that same pixel uh, over here. Uh, so then that is the, the deviation. It can also be normalized uh, and have a fractional deviation and so on. So I think this may be uh, what's shown here is probably a fractional deviation. What is shown on, uh, on the bottom left panel over here are uh, uh, the green line corresponds to the, the model profile and the, the red uh, uh, dots uh, or the red points are the actual data taken from the original image on top left. And so if you have a, a very good fit, then all across from zero radius out to large radii up to the full extent of the galaxy, your data and your fit should follow each other. So uh, this is a one dimensional profile. How do you obtain a one dimensional profile? It's an azimuthally averaged profile uh, following the isophotes of the galaxy. So you, you change the theta, but you don't go around in a circle you go around in an ellipse and measure the, uh, the intensity of light everywhere. And you average over that, the, all of those pixels. And then you get uh, the number that we have uh, shown here, either in the green curve or the red dots, which represent the, the real data. Okay. So, the actual minimization is done via what is called as a chi-square minimization, uh, where you try to minimize the difference in the ith pixel value between uh, your actual data and uh, your model. 
Okay, so you have a observed uh, flux value, usually in terms of counts, uh, and uh, your model flux value. Uh, you want to minimize that, but you want to minimize all of this while being weighted by the error in measurement of that pixel. Okay, uh, so you need to have some some way of independently measuring uh, the error in the ith pixel. And usually a Poisson distribution is assumed. So you, you obtain a Poisson error on the flux, every flux value that you have. And for every flux value, for every pixel, you will therefore have a sigma i. Uh, this is the standard deviation. The square of that is, of course, the variance. So this is a variance weighted fit. Okay. Uh, Chi-square fit usually refers to uh, some kind of weighted fit. So otherwise it's similar, if it's unweighted, the chi-square would become your standard least square fit, okay? But this is a weighted fit, uh, weighted by uh, the error uh, of the fit. So the error, of course, depends on the signal to noise ratio of the data. So if you are looking at the center of the galaxy where you have a very high signal to noise ratio, then you'll have a, a smaller fractional error. Uh, then when you are looking at the uh, galaxy outside, at the edge of the galaxy where it's very faint, you will have a higher error. So all of this uh, error computation uh, should have been covered in your uh, astronomical uh, techniques course, which you are doing now. Okay. So, so what are now the functions that we can, analytic functions, that we can use to model the light distribution uh, of the disk. So, so usually we assume an exponential disk and that is because observationally we have seen for the last 50 years or so, uh, we've known that the, the disk light profile is almost always an exponential. So there are two free parameters. One is IS uh, over here, which is the, uh, when our disk is zero, which means at the center, what is the intensity? And then of course there is our S, which is the uh, exponential uh, scale length of the disk. Which is used in this equation is computed here, uh, wherein X uh, is the, the deviation along the X axis and the Y axis. And then you have to uh, take into account the fact that it's not as going to be a circular disk, but an elliptical disk, uh, where ellipticity of the disk is nothing but uh, one minus cos i, where i is the inclination angle. Our disk is the galactocentric radius, but actually it is the length of the semi-major axis of the elliptical isophot uh, that you are that you are using. R d is the scale length of the disk. And uh, IS, as I said, refers to intensity at the center and I is the inclination angle. So if you know, so if you leave ellipticity of the disk as a free parameter, you leave the scale length as a free parameter and you uh, leave uh, IS as a free parameter, uh, then you will be able to uh, obtain a fit for the disk of the galaxy. Uh, inclination angle is uh, defines the ellipticity of the disk for you. So if you have a face on disk, I told you the other day that the disk is circular. So the ellipticity, uh, uh, if cos i is one, uh, sorry, if i is zero, zero inclination, then the ellipticity is zero. It's not elliptical at all. It's circular. Okay. But as if your viewing angle changes and the disk becomes more and more inclined, then that circle will begin to look as a like an ellipse to you, correct? From uh, the best fit uh, ED. So look at this last equation. If I tell you ED, you can determine I and uh, vice versa. If I tell you I, you will be able to determine ED. But since you can't determine I uh, directly, what you do is you just measure the ellipticity of the disk and use that to compute i. So that's why I said this is not going to be an independent free parameter. Once you determine this, this is fully determined. 
so that's the idea so if it is very very close to edge on then the inclination angle will be close to 90 and uh, therefore this uh, quantity will become closer and closer uh, to one okay for the disc yes it doesn't allow for deviations from perfect circle for a disc and that is a very reasonable assumption it is very hard to sustain a elliptical disc for for kinematic reasons because what that re leads to is a kind of uh, forcing function that tends to circularize the disc so so the disc if it is in a equilibrium configuration, it is a very reasonable assumption that it is circular. Right. Okay. Uh, so, hello. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, can you uh, go back to the previous slide once? Uh, yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, no, the uh, ellipticity one. Yeah. Ellipticity one. Yes. Yeah, so uh, if uh, I mean, if I uh, so if cos i is equal to zero, uh, I mean, for the edge on position that you were saying, right? So ED then becomes one, right? Uh, yes. I mean, so in that in that case, the R disk expression then th th that diverges, right? I mean, because the denominator. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how yes. is that taken care of? I mean, in that particular. Uh, yeah, you don't fit for a pure edge on uh, disk. See, it oh, doesn't okay, matter. So. It, it only diverges if it is exactly 90. Right, 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 right. And if it is 89.9 degrees, there is no, no problem. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Right. So, so in principle, it, it, it actually is quite tricky to fit a very edge on disk. Even if oh. the inclination angle is, say, 80 degrees or 85 degrees, it becomes very, very tricky. Uh, okay. Primary reason for that is that your, uh, uh, your dust absorption, uh, optical depth increases drastically. And so your dust lanes begin to come into the picture and so on. And the whole thing goes for a complete toss. So all that I'm talking about is, is something that will work on a large fraction of galaxies, but it won't work on all galaxies. But again, you can't even morphologically classify it easily if it is edge on, because you don't see whether it's a spiral or an S0, you don't know anything. I mean, right. Even these basic things for a uh, real true edge on disk are impossible to determine. So it, so this one does as well as visual classification, but in the edge cases, it will fail. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. So now, uh, sometimes it is uh, necessary to fit not one disk, but two disks. There is an inner disk and then there is an outer disk that share the same position and angle and ellipticity generally, but have different brightnesses and scale length scales. So that IS and R disk are the two parameters that will be different. And you will have to model this disk as a the total disk as a linear sum of the inner disk and the outer disk. Uh, it can be that the inner disk is uh, somewhat uh, is truncated or the outer disk is truncated. So you may have to put length scales that up to so many kiloparsec, you have the inner disk. So fit it uh, separately for the data from the uh, rest of the galaxy, which contains the outer disk. Uh, this ability is becoming increasingly useful because galaxies with double exponential disks are now being frequently found, found with the deeper and high fidelity images uh, that are possible with modern uh, digital cameras. Now for the bulge. Uh, for the bulge, uh, the function is slightly more complicated. Uh, so if you want the bulge uh, x comma y, uh, then again, here there is a there's a scaling parameter uh, which scales the bulge up and down, and then the, there is R bulge over R e, but that is further raised to an exponential uh, one by n, okay, where n refers to something known as the Sursic parameter. 
and uh, similar to uh, the disc you have to take into account the ellipticity of the bulge now remember the ellipticity of the bulge uh, is something that is intrinsic uh, it depends on if the bulge uh, is prolate oblate etc the observed ellipticity will depend on your viewing angle but it is intrinsic it is not that the bulge is circular the bulge in general is not circular it can be circular but in general it's not right for n equal to 4 uh, uh, if you put n equal to 4 so this n is referred to as the sershik index and for n equal to 4 it becomes what is called the de vocular's function so if you just plug in n equal to 4 over here uh that beca becomes the the de vocular's function uh because it was discovered by a scientist uh, astronomer named de vocular's uh, he was interested in studying ellipticals and uh, he fit the light profiles of thousands of ellipticals and he found that uh, n is very close to 4 uh, for most ellipticals uh for n equal to 1 this becomes like an exponential uh when n is equal to 0.5 it becomes a gaussian so it's a very very flexible function uh it can change its uh, nature uh, by changing the just one parameter for values in the range uh 1 is to 1 to 4 uh it describes quite well the bulges in late type uh, spiral galaxies uh Uh, these are referred to as pseudo bulges and later on when we study bulges in greater detail we will see that there are two kinds of bulges which are both from their uh, st structural and kinematic properties but also in terms of their formation and evolution scenarios are distinct objects from uh, the bulges that we find in early type spirals and in ellipticals uh, which are referred to as uh classical bulges the similarity between uh, uh, uh the classical bulge and the uh, pseudo bulge is that they do follow the light profile is still a sershik but with a somewhat different uh, uh, sershik index uh, sershik index close to 4 uh, is uh, is what uh, you have in classical bulges and sershik index between 1 and 2 is what you typically find in the pseudo bulges uh it's easy to realize that the larger the value of n the more concentrated is the light and mass of the bulge or the elliptical in the center so centrally concentrated bulges uh, tend to have a high value of n uh you have a number uh, quantity here called r e uh it uh, refers to what is called as the effective radius Uh, the effective radius of a galaxy is the one that contains half the total light of the galaxy uh, if it's a pure bulge then you have to integrate from 0 to infinity this uh, this function uh, from r going from 0 to infinity and uh, you will get the total intensity of the bulge and re is the radius which contains half the total intensity of the bulge uh the numerical constants bn is chosen so that the brightness at the effective radius is the effective brightness okay so what does that mean the brightness at the effective radius is the uh, uh is equal to the effective brightness which is ie so bn is chosen in such a way that uh, if you take the intensity at re that will be equal to the best fit value that you have got which is re and bn it turns out depends only on the value of n so the you can solve for it numerically and obtain the value of bn if you know the value of n so here is what uh, the sershik profile looks like so uh, this is for different values of n uh, n equal to 0.5 as you as we saw is uh, uh is uh, uh gaussian uh, n equal to 1 is the exponential and these quantities are steeper than exponential note that we have a uh, log scale on the y axis 
so so as you can see that as you go to higher and higher values of n uh, the the profile becomes steeper and steeper at the center these profiles have been chosen in such a way that they have the same value of re uh, and therefore they they cross each other at uh, uh, r equal to re there's a there's a common point where they cross uh, the other thing to notice is the profile which is very steep uh, near the center, which is, for example, n equal to 8 profile, is also the one that is least steep or shallowest for r greater than re. So high values of n indicate that the profile will be very steep near the center, but it will be slowly varying as you uh, go away from the center, far away from the center. You can write the same function in, uh, in uh, different ways. Okay, So one where you, instead of using the intensity at the effective radius Re, you, you uh, replace the Ie with I0, uh, which, is the, uh, uh, which is the intensity at the center at R equal to 0. Uh, or you can uh, rewrite it, again, go back to your Ie, and just put a minus one over there uh, instead of what you had previously. The coefficients C and D n will change. Again, they'll be functions of n, but they'll be different. So once you have a model for the bulge and the disk, you can compute some quantities which will be of interest in studying galaxy structure. So you can derive uh, one of the most important quantities, which is called the B by T luminosity ratio, or sometimes it's called the B by T flux ratio. And what it basically does is that basically it's the flux in the bulge divided by the flux of the bulge and the disk. Here we are assuming for now that there are only two components. As the number of components increase, uh, the denominator can change. You could have additional terms in the denominator. By using the structural parameters involved in the Sersic profile, the total flux of the bulge can be found analytically using uh, this formula. So what we are doing now is uh, 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 doing uh, 2 pi r i r d r. So taking a small uh, circ uh, elliptical uh, 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 interval, uh, dr, uh, and then integrating uh, from 0 to infinity uh, uh, by uh, using the value of ir as given by the Sersic function. And if you do that, uh, if you do this integral, uh, you get uh, this as the solution of that integral. So it depends uh, on the value of bn, of course. Uh, but it depends on the value of the intensity at the effective radius, uh, the, the effective radius itself, how large it is. If the effective radius is larger, obviously that's a bigger galaxy. It's going to contain more light and uh, the bulge flux is going to be higher. And this is the incomplete gamma function uh, of uh, with 2n as the argument. You can do the same exercise, do the integral to pi i r i r d r for the disk and use the, instead of using the Sersic function, use the exponential function there for i r. And then you get a value uh, uh, for f d, which is uh, 11.948 uh, i d into r d square. Of course, there's no n parameter here. So there's, there are only two variables, uh, i d and r d. Uh, that will determine for you the flux of the disk. If you plug in the, these two numbers here, uh, you can calculate the bulge to total luminosity ratio from the bulge disk decomposition. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Right. So, it is very hard to determine. See, the galaxy is something that uh, doesn't have an edge. 
it just keeps on falling the stellar density keeps on falling keeps on falling keeps on falling but there is no sharp edge now it turns out that if you truncate this if you truncate this you will get an answer but then that will become very different so you will truncate at 40 kilo per sec i will say no no it's you should truncate at 50 kilo per sec somebody else will uh, say that truncate at 100 kilo per sec right there'll be endless confusion in comparing your measurements with mine to prevent that you integrate at infinity up to infinity the variation will be small so you you can try to do this integral by just integrating up to 100 kilo per sec 200 kilo per sec and compare that with the integral to infinity. And you will find that in practice, the variation will be about a percent or so, two percent, not more than that. Yeah, so if the, if the, because the IR falls off pretty quickly, uh, integrating it beyond a point uh, won't, won't get you much. Consider any, for example, the simplest case is an exponentially decaying function. If you integrate up to the point where the function is looking nearly flat, right, uh, or nearly zero, not flat, uh, coming down to nearly zero, then the area under the integral beyond that point is going to be very small. That's the idea. And because these are steeply falling functions, uh, you, uh, you can do that. If it were less steep, then it gets uh, more problematic. Yeah. No, wait, we have done this. Okay, so now we said uh, a bit earlier that uh, there are lots of barred uh, galaxies. So are we going to fit a bar or not? If the bar is very weak, it makes little sense to fit the bar because you are, you are increasing the number of free parameters uh, without uh, getting any additional benefit. Because if the bar is very weak, it's the measurement of its parameters also going to become very uncertain and unreliable. So it's better not to fit the bar. But if your bar is very obvious, it's very strong, there is no way you can avoid fitting the bar. So it turns out that a Sursic function can also be used to describe bars with 0 0.4 uh, less than n less than 1. A bar in a late type galaxy can be well fitted by an exponential, whereas bars in early type galaxies have a flatter luminosity profile. The plot on the next page shows the Sursic function for n equal to 0 0.4, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, uh, 0 0.8, and 1. So the last one is the steepest one is n equal to 1, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, and uh, 0 0.4. Uh, as we shall see in a minute, there is an alternative to using uh, the Sursic function, uh, which is now more commonly used. Uh, but bars are notoriously hard to fit because you need to use uh, what are called boxy isophotes and usually with a very high ellipticity. So remember the bar, uh, the bar, I mean, if you wanted to model a bar uh, naively, you would say I would model it as a rectangular object not as an ellipse, not as uh, uh, a circle. Uh, so that's why you, you go for something called boxy isophotes. We'll come to that in a minute. And uh, with fairly high ellipticity, you don't have a circular bar. Uh, the effective radius of the Sursic function must also be carefully fitted. And uh, unlike uh, the bulge where you can fit up sort of assume the function extends to infinity, uh, you will need an outer cutoff radius. So you will have to truncate the bar at some radius by trying to guess, perhaps by looking at the image and trying to guess at what point you want to truncate the bar. So here's the concept of boxy and disky isophotes. So at the top left, uh, you see an image. Uh, which is, uh, which is a nice uh, elliptical galaxy. Uh, on top right, uh, what we've done is we have basically pinched the galaxy along the major axis and made it a little bit pointy at this point. 
So these are referred to as disky isophones because it almost seems that there's a disk along the major axis. Sorry, sorry, what am I doing? No, no, no. Okay, now that I got very confused. Uh, I'm sorry. These are boxy isophones. You can see that they are more rectangular. Okay, so what we've done is instead of stretching things along the major axis, we have stretched things a little bit along the minor axis and you get uh, uh, the uh, isophones here, which are called as boxy isophones. Uh, the reverse is true here, where you feel like the uh, uh, thing has been stretched in one direction. Actually, from my angle, I'm not able to see it clearly over there, but I hope you guys can see it. And so this is the major axis of the galaxy, and we have stretched it a little bit. And this is referred to as a disky isophone. Okay. So here is, uh, okay. So you can write a mathematical expression uh, for, uh, the, for the diskiness uh, by uh, using this kind of expression. And here you have a additional parameter C which quantifies the extent uh, of uh, boxiness or diskiness. Uh, you can draw these functions and uh, verify for yourself uh, <laughs> that if C equal to zero, you get a pure ellipse, uh, this X square plus Y square uh, over Q, uh, which is of course the ellipticity uh, of the bar. For C greater than zero, one gets a boxy ellipse uh, or isophore. In this case, there is a deficit of light in the direction of major and minor axis. For C uh, uh, less than zero, one gets a disky isophote where there is an excess of light in the direction of the major and minor axis. So uh, while fitting the bar, you very often have to fit uh, with this rather more complicated function for R. Some people nowadays prefer to use a different function while fitting the intensity distribution of the bar as a function of radius. And this is this function. So R out is, uh, is a sort of truncation radius. This function should not be used outside of, of R out. And beta and alpha are uh, two free parameters. Alpha here controls the sharpness of the truncation, whereas the central slope is controlled by the parameter beta. The Ferrer function is quite close to the Sersic function, to a Sersic function with n less than or equal to 0.5. So, uh, so this is the Ferrer profile uh, for uh, different values of beta and uh, different values of alpha. Uh, so as you can see, changing beta uh, uh, seems to change uh, what happens uh, uh, at the center, near the center, and changing alpha uh, seems to change uh, what happens on, on the outside, how sharply truncated is your function. So for example, alpha equal to 0.5, gives you a function that slowly falls off uh, up to very close to the truncation radius and then just drops off rapidly. So maybe your bar is an alpha equal to 0.5 bar, maybe it's an alpha equal to four bar uh, that you'll have to get by doing the chi-square fit. Okay, so now uh, we've covered the idea of the bulge, we've covered the idea of the disk, but in some galaxies, you have a nuclear source. Uh, any idea why uh, you may have, a, by a nuclear source, I mean a very bright intensity at the center. That's right. Mm, so AGN? very well you have, sorry? AGN? Yes, that's correct. So uh, where you have, if you have an AGN, an active galactic nucleus, then uh, not just in the optical, but in other bands as well, you will have near the center a very rapid increase in intensity. 
which is uh, which the your uh, sarsic function etc cannot model it's much steeper than that and uh, you don't want to uh, if you miss fitting out for that point uh, uh, point source then your sarsic function will become very steep at the center but it will not fit the data well on the outside because it will become excessively shallow at the outside so you 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 won't get a good fit so you must have a third component in addition to the bulge in the disk while fitting AGN uh, for the point source at the center. Uh, but the same effect happens uh, 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 when you want to model the point spread function, right? Because you're, you have the point source, but the point source uh, 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 is of course related to the point source function. Point source function tells you, given a point source, how is that point source uh, affected or measure in your measurement, in your actual observation. And that may be because of diffraction, uh, the point spread function, the intrinsic optical function, or it may be an effect caused by uh, the uh, Earth's atmosphere. Now, if you are using this Moffat function uh, for uh, fitting a point source, uh, you must use n equal to 4.765 when you are using a ground-based tensor. Any idea why? Of course, I mean, I, we, can, we don't know how to work it out, but what is why this number has come about? The clue is that it's only needed when you're doing a point source observation. Sorry, a ground-based observation of a point source or of a new galaxy nucleus. I mean, okay, is it because so the, of the effects of the atmosphere? I mean, for ground waves? Yes, yes, so the, correct. That's right. You are the, on the right track. The point spreads out and because... Yes. So there that. is uh, a theory called the Kolmogorov turbulence theory. Okay. Uh, so Kolmogorov's theory of turbulence uh, tells you how uh, wavefronts get distorted, uh, how much turbulence there is in the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, if you do a full calculation using Kolmogorov theory uh, for light that is coming in as point source, plane wave that hits the atmosphere, how does that uh, wave spread out? If you do that formally, you will get that index. And you'll get a function like this with n equal to 4.765. So you're right, it comes from the Earth's atmosphere and from our model, uh, the Kolmogor of uh, turbulence of the Earth's atmosphere. Now, I have given you a sort of uh, simplified and simplistic uh, view of this whole bulge disk decomposition. But in practice, there are a number of degeneracies. There are uh, things which are correlated. There are parameters where uh, the errors are correlated. So you can get into a situation where if you make a error in fitting one parameter, you uh, will make uh, also make an error in perhaps the opposite direction in fitting another parameter. So you have to be really careful. And uh, that's why I say it remains a black art. It's a little bit of skill. Uh, with experience, you know that uh, something is correct or wrong. So this is the Moffat profile uh, for different values uh, of n. Uh, as I mentioned on the previous slide, if you take n to infinity, then this just becomes a Gaussian. Okay, so now we've uh, reached a stage. Suppose you have an image of a galaxy, which is uh, uh, very similar, let's say, to the image that you have at bottom right. What you will do is you'll use a Moffat function to model the point source at the center corresponding to the AGN. Uh, you will perhaps use a, a Sersic function to model the bulge of the galaxy. Uh, you will use a 
an exponential to model the disk. And then you will add up all of your models together. So it's just a linear addition uh, and you will get your total model. And uh, hopefully if you have done things right, then uh, the residuals will be very small. If you take your total model and you subtract that from your original galaxy image, if the residuals are noise-like, uh, then you know that you've done a good job in the fitting. Okay. Uh, so uh, I have a couple of more functions to talk about. And uh, uh, so we'll, we'll cover those uh, before we stop. Uh, so in 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope was launched. It had a lot of teething troubles at the beginning, but by 1993, after its first a repair mission, it started functioning very well. And people wanted to use the Hubble to study the, the course of galaxies. And uh, that was related, we'll, we'll come to that later. The profiles of the cores of galaxies uh, were something of elliptical galaxies, especially, were a prediction of uh, cosmological theories, what they should look like. Okay, whether they should be cuspy or they should be flat and so on. Uh, so people wanted to test the predictions of various cosmological models against the observations. And for the first time, you could do it uh, using the Hubble Space Telescope because the Hubble Space Telescope uh, being above the Earth's atmosphere uh, was not subject to the effects of the atmosphere, uh, turbulence, etc., and uh, had a ex very excellent diffraction limited uh, kind of imaging. And uh, so then they said, okay, let's fit the, the profile uh, of just the central uh, regions using uh, uh, a double power law. So you have a outer law slope, uh, you have an inner slope, and uh, alpha is a parameter which controls the sharpness of the transition. Uh, from uh, the inner slope to the outer slope. So this is like fitting a, a double uh, exponential uh, disk, uh, except that there you don't have a transition parameter. And uh, the motivation for using this profile is that the nuclei of galaxies appear to fit well in 1D by a double power law of this kind. This is called the Nuker profile. And uh, Lauer et al. 1995 uh, were, was one of the first papers uh, to try and uh, apply this to the just the nuclear regions of, of galaxies and measure the profile. So here are uh, uh, plots of the nuclear profile for different values of alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, this is uh, done at very, very small radii. Remember, we are fitting only the nuclear region. While fitting the nuclear profile, you don't fit the whole galaxy. Uh, very often, that wasn't a problem with HST because uh, HST has very good resolution, but it also has a very small field of view. So if you observe a nearby galaxy, the whole galaxy will not even fit into the field of view of the telescope it will be bigger than that. So it actually, with the HST for nearby galaxies, you can only measure the one part of the galaxy. They chose, of course, uh, Lauer et al. Chose, chose to measure the Nuker profile. Okay, so the next step perhaps is uh, fitting spiral arms. Okay, so we've taken bulge, we've taken the disk, we've fitted the point source, uh, for HST images, we've used the Nuker profile, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we still have not accounted for a feature that dominates uh, in, uh, uh, in spiral galaxies, which is the spiral arms. So it turns out that it is mostly not necessary. Uh, the reason for that is that Although visually uh, the, the spiral arms are very prominent and distinct and so on, if you integrate 
the, remember the spiral arms are sitting on the underlying intensity of the disc. So there is a disc light profile and addition to that, there are the spiral arms. So if you, uh, if you uh, uh, calculate how much light is contributed by the spiral arms relative to the disc, even in very prominent galaxies, it turns out that it is uh, about 5 or 10%. It is not a very large number. And in most other galaxies, it's much smaller than that. Even when you have a, a quite an obvious spiral. Uh, exactly. The reason why we don't want to model it is because when we, so far, when we have modeled these uh, components, they're relatively... Uh, uh, smoothly varying functions, which can be uh, modeled using two, three, four free parameters, not more than that. For each component that we've looked at, there have been a limited number of free parameters. But if you want to model a complex structure like spirals, then you will need many more free parameters. And as uh, if you have done any kind of fitting uh, in your work so far, you know that once you introduce additional free parameters, arbitrary numbers of them, then you can fit any function, right? And, uh, but that doesn't give you any physical insight uh, at all. So therefore, most people prefer not to fit uh, spiral arms, even when you are uh, fitting spiral galaxies. And uh, uh, so what, what will then happen in your residuals? What will your residuals look like? If you do this, you'll see the spiral arms. Okay? You subtract the bulge, you subtract the disc, and you are left with the spiral arms. You sometimes, uh, sometimes it does happen when you do uh, fitting that you, uh, you, to start with, you don't see any spiral arms because they're extremely faint and weak. But you model the bulge, you model the disc, subtract that out, and in the residual, you see the spiral arms. And you say, oh, this is a spiral. So that can also happen frequently. So the idea is to not fit them. But occasionally, if the spiral is very nearby and uh, there's lots of uh, high quality data, then there are a few people uh, who, uh, who try to uh, model the, the disk. So you uh, model the spiral arms. So while modeling the spiral arms, you typically have some kind of inner radius and outer radius within which you model the uh, spiral arms. And then you have to also use uh, uh, some parameter that uh, models how tightly wound the spiral arms are, okay? And as you can see here at bottom right, uh, you have uh, very tightly wound uh, spiral arms. And uh, here uh, you have very lightly wound uh, spiral arms. So you can do that. Uh, but still you will be left with residuals because any kind of light profile that you assume that varies with, with theta uh, will still not be able to model the H2 regions uh, in the spiral arm. So the spiral arms, within the spiral arm itself, there are patches of star forming regions, which we refer to as uh, H2, H2 meaning ionized hydrogen clouds. Uh, these are often OB associations as well. Uh, these are, will, will not get modeled. So now uh, if you subtract out your model of the spiral arm, uh, you will not have an arm left, but you'll still have blobs of emission corresponding to these H2 regions. Uh, which will still be left when you do some kind of uh, smoothed spiral arm fit as has been uh, demonstrated here. Okay, so uh, I'm done with uh, whatever I wanted to present today. Uh, uh, before I take any questions, just an announcement. I've sent all of you an email uh, uh, yesterday. I hope all of you have got it. If anybody who's on this call uh, who has not received an email from me yesterday uh, announcing the extra lecture tomorrow, uh, then you are not on my mailing list. Uh, so please send me an email. Uh, but if you have received it, uh, no problem. We will meet again tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock 
for an extra class to compensate for the class that we will miss on Friday. Okay, so are there any questions on uh, either this lecture or anything we have covered so far? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so there are two answers to that, or two parts to this answer. There are two kinds of halos. Are you aware of that? What are the halo? What is the halo composed of? Diffuse elements, but what? I mean, we know there are only there is star, gas, dust, and dark matter. I mean, there is nothing else. So the halo is actually there are two kinds of halos. One is what is called as the stellar halo. Okay. The Milky Way has a stellar halo which is composed of halo stars. And just like the bulk stars, the halo stars are very old stars. Andromeda also has uh, very old stars, population two stars. Uh, these objects are very, very diffuse, very, very low intensity, and contribute very little to the total light of the galaxy. And that is why we don't model them because they're they're very faint. Because if we start modeling the halo, we should model the tidal tails and the tidal stream and so on. That also we don't model because they are very, very faint. That's the reason we don't model. Now, uh, but the other component of the halo, which is not insignificant, which is very massive, is the dark matter halo. That is even more massive than all the, these bulge disks, uh, everything combined. Right? It's more massive than that. In typical galaxy, you may have 10 times as much mass in dark matter as you have in the dark matter halo, as you have in the, uh, in the uh, baryonic matter, the visible matter. So that we don't model in the bulge disk decomposition only because there's no light coming out of it. So there's nothing, we are modeling the light distribution, right? There's no light signal coming, so we don't model it. But of course, when we come to the study of galaxy formation and evolution, at that point, we, the, the halo becomes uh, terribly important and uh, it affects in a myriad ways the uh, formation and evolution of galaxies. So there the dark matter halo cannot be. But here we are going to ignore it because we are modeling the light. So, so the two parts of the answer, stellar halo is very faint. Uh, should not, cannot be modeled observationally. And the dark matter halo is very massive and very important, but we can't see it. Sorry? It'll stay in the, see, the residual, remember, is, a, is subject to noise. So if you are trying to measure a quantity which is very much smaller than the noise, uh, you are not going to measure it. There are techniques to measure it by stacking, for example. So, for example, if you have a stellar halo, which is very faint, which you can't see, but uh, you take 100 galaxies, which are otherwise similar to each other, and you stack their images together, because the noise uh, will cancel out and the signal will, will pile up. So, you can see stellar, and there have been some works like that, which stack together many galaxies, uh, to detect the stellar halo. But for while fitting individual objects, there is no, no way we can detect uh, light from the stellar halo except uh, Milky Way and Andromeda. Because these are bright enough that we can actually, or nearby enough, that we can see stars in the halo. We can see stars in the halo. There are also experiments to try and measure uh, if there are uh, compact halo objects, which are uh, either very faint or uh, made of dark matter, and uh, uh, to see whether gravitational lensing can be used to uh, detect such objects. So there was a, uh, there's a long running project called MACO, uh, Massive uh, Compact Halo Object uh, Experiment, uh, which is, aims to see whether gravitational lensing is seen uh, 
due to these uh, compact halo objects. So the halo is there, but it's very faint light waves. Yeah. Yes. 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 No, no, no. One assumes that Newton's law is followed and therefore dark matter must exist. So that the alternative to dark matter is to modify Newton's law. But then the, there are different kinds of modifications. Possible. Yes. So the simulation that I showed you assumed that uh, 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 Newton's law is not modified and there are dark matter particles of some kind. Uh, assuming Newton's law is not modified by measuring the rotation curve of the Milky Way, Andromeda, etc., we are able to find out how much dark matter that there is and what is its distribution. Uh, we will look at dark matter profiles and so on. So we have looked at light profiles today, but there are also uh, dark matter profiles uh, that uh, uh, come from theory and also from numerical simulations. Uh, how dark matter uh, intensity or density varies as a function of radius from the center of the galaxy. So, so these two galaxies, the star actually like yes. So uh, dark matter is usually assumed to be non-collisional. So they like star, the dark matter goes through, but every dark matter particle feels the gravity of every other particle. So you, while calculating the gravitational potential, uh, you have to use the number, density, velocity of the dark matter. So that is what is done. So remember, they don't take this simulation too seriously. Okay. I mean, it's about an event. It, it can be redone in 10 years and uh, the details will change. Uh, but there is no doubt that the collision is going to happen. Uh, exact details will change as our measurements of dark matter, everything improves. As I told you yesterday or last time is that the number of stars in Andromeda and Milky Way is, has been changing over the last 20 years. Not because the stars are increasing, but because our measurements are getting better and better. And we are finding stars that we were missing uh, at previous times. Uh, and because of that, the, the dark matter uh, calculation also changing. So the amount of dark matter in uh, estimated in Andromeda and Milky Way is not a static number at any point. It, I mean, it evolves as a function of time as our understanding improves. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you will have to do it uh, visually. So uh, uh, let me try to see. I think in the previous. So suppose this is a barred uh, spiral galaxy. So I have to physically define where does the bar start and where does it end. So I may say that, okay, this central region, this much is all bulge. And the bar starts over here and extends up to here. So this I've done visually. It will be subjective, yes. So somebody else will say, no, no, not up to here, but I'll go up to here. So there will be slight differences. But no, if somebody is saying the bar, uh, bar starts over here and goes up to here, then obviously they're wrong. <laughs> so that, so that's why I said it's it's a it's a subjective thing. It is not a objective thing, and it's very hard to interpret in a non-statistical way. So many of the measurements that we do for galaxies, uh, if you try to do it for one galaxy and get it right, it's very difficult. But if you do it for 100,000 galaxies, uh, then uh, you can make statistical claims about what is seen in the data without worrying about whether 
uh, your uh, uh, bar ended here or here for one if you got it wrong for one galaxy out of 100000 it won't matter that's the idea but otherwise you're right i mean somebody else will choose a slightly different radius maybe with all these ai technologies we can do better meaning the ai will look at the data more carefully and so on and uh, do it in a better way yes but they get uh, see they don't one of the major limitations in this whole game is uh, uh, human impatience and uh, human error okay so if a lot of errors are made when you get tired and you are doing something by hand and uh, you will make a mistake the machine has that advantage that it never gets tired okay uh, are there any questions on the online zoom yes sir i have um, three questions if nobody has questions then i have three questions i will ask them yeah 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 so please go ahead yeah. ask them one by one Yes, yes. And the first question is related to Sakai. I mean, when we fit galaxy, in the Sakai has a great role in the determination of the fitting parameters. What is the proper way to determine the Sakai um, component? I mean, Sakai around a galaxy. Yes. Uh, so this uh, again, a bit of cheating. I uh, so he's asking about the sky, right? The sky background. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So. Uh, Remember that we are modeling the light. So if there is some background, which is uniform or non-uniform, which is coming from the sky, the sky. the sky background is in a very dark sky location is usually in a uniform. And it's coming yeah. from air glow in the Earth's atmosphere. So there is particles which are excited by the sun, which are emitting light uh, at very, very low intensities. So that kind of completely dark moonless night sky uh, uh, under photometric conditions can be modeled by a constant. So what you do is that uh, you have an additional free parameter, which is like a DC offset uh, with uh, respect to completely dark sky. And you fit that as an additional free parameter in your bulge density composition. Sometimes there can be a gradient uh, in in the sky so typically for example if the moon is nearby you're observing the galaxy then the moonlight uh, as you go further and further away it gets fainter and fainter uh, but there is a gradient on the side of the moon it will be slightly brighter than the opposite side uh, so you can have an additional parameter that uh, puts in a slope and you will have to have a third parameter to give the direction of the gradient uh, so you can have the, so people do use uh, these, at least these two or three different uh, ways of modeling the sky background, but becomes in very, very important uh, for ground-based data. It's less important for HST because HST does not have uh, any, uh, the sky background, the air glow background is hundred times slower than what it is uh, on Earth, there is still some background coming mostly from zodiacal light, which is dust in the plane of the solar system. Uh, but that's 100 times weaker than here. And of course, uh, there is uh, no moon scattering and things like that. Okay, so second question, please. First, announce your name. Yeah, Sorry. my name is Shiraz. Shiraz. Shiraz okay. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Shiraz. Yes, yes. Uh, the second question is biology composition. It's just two dimensional biology composition. Then PSF has a role. And what is, how is, what's the proper way to construct it? For example, in, in HDSS image, suppose PSF. Uh, 
yeah no no i didn't quite uh, oh, you were gosh. talking of two dimensional bulge decomposition of sdss images is that i didn't quite get what your question yes. is so psf has a role i mean uh, we use this uh, psf in it when we do bulge psf we use we use in bulge decomposition decomposition uh your voice is breaking up very badly we are not able to make out so why don't you do one thing uh, your remaining questions just email them to me uh, just send me an email uh, and i will yes. discuss those questions at the beginning of the next yes. class yes okay just please email them okay so yeah. yes yes yes